name is Andres Gilart. I'm the business developer for some of our digital solutions and uh, responsible for the cybersecurity portfolio in uh, SMO RI. I'm Rua and I joined Siemens three years ago and I work as a PSSE uh, on our uh, mass transit segment. One of the things that I ended up really liking all of our projects have a real tangible impact, so you're able to, every time you go to a train station or you go to the street and what's on, if you pay attention closely, you can check all the things we do on a daily basis. Cybersecurity never ends, but yeah, you feel accomplishment. Our systems have become to be so complex that it's very, very hard to know exactly what's going on unless you have very good transparency. So that's why actually, for us, the cybersecurity is not only about protection, it's just to bring transparency to know what's going on and so you can act. Currently, I'm working on different customer projects. And uh, for now, I am working on the design of the cybersecurity concept for uh, our customer in Milan. One of the things that I would say defines me quite a lot is my work, so I really like it. I've been quite lucky to find a place and a job that I really like. So yeah, if Simon wouldn't even be paying me, I would be very happy to just come here and just spend some time. The work we do on cybersecurity is relevant. It gives me like uh, a sense for the work I do. Did you ever wonder how do trains find their way through the network? And well, the answer is partly about so-called interlockings. Those are the brains in a rail network which tell the switches left, right, left, and then the train arrives at the right station. In the past, interlockings, heavy metal, that was hardware, and a lot of mechanical parts. Of course, now there's more and more software in them, which means we have to protect them, make them cyber secure. How we can do that, I'll talk about this with two experts from Siemens Mobility. One we have with us, uh, Rua Spui, your uh, product and solution security expert at mobility in mass transit. And there's Andres, Andres Gonzalez Guilarte, your cyber security portfolio manager in uh, Siemens Mobility rail infrastructure. And uh, Andres, great to have you now. When you think about old school and new hardware interlockings versus now software, which one is safer? So um, both. So um, for us, when we talk about our, our legacy infrastructure or our older technology and our customers, um, just, just the fact that they are older doesn't mean that they are less safe or less secure. It's just that they have a f the different way of doing so. Um, when we think about older technology that we have all around the world, and that is because we have very long life cycles. Um, they approach security and safety in, in a very different way. In the case of security, most of the older systems are designed to be isolated. And that means physical isolation. They are like a castle with a moat. I am protecting this and no one gets in, no one gets out. That's how it would go. Um, with newer systems, we do not have that luxury. So um, when we're moving to more digital systems, electronic interlockings, and much more based on software, um, you need to have connect connectivity between different elements. That brings, yes, a lot of efficiencies and a lot of new functionalities, but it brings some, uh, some risk and vulnerabilities that need to be assessed. Um, and that's why, in the, especially in the case of newer systems, it's all about the software. Let's have a look at how historically the uh, software component has increased. I think it was 10% back in the 1990s. Where are we today, roughly? Yeah, so today is, is over 50%. So um, this, is a, this is a trend that among the industry, different companies might, might argue, is it 50, is it 40, is it 55? It's irrelevant. What we all agree is that there has been a paradigm shift and it's a, a growing trend that most of the system is no longer a hardware-based logic. It's going towards a software-based logic and it will increase over time. Uh, that, is, that is not debatable anymore. But it, it's bringing new vulnerabilities, you said. They're different from the old ones. The metal may have broken. Now someone might try to break into the system. Correct. That's a problem. How do, how, how do we solve that? You, you see that in different architectures. So, um, and you will 
to be very precise, you will see that also very differently depending on the country, the region, the even the operator itself. Um, it's it's not it's never the same answer. So the way I would I would put it is a it's a new challenge that we have. Um, the in the architectures that we were having it with legacy components and newer ones, um, we try to focus in in a in a very to put it in a very simple way in in three key characteristics. We focus in protect, we focus in monitor, and we focus in updating. That means knowing what you have and keep it safe and secure, knowing what is what's going on, being able to monitor in real time the network. And then once you discover, just because it's known a known vulnerability or you discover there's something wrong with it, you either patch it or you update something it, over time. It's a huge task. I, I took the train here from, from Munich and when you look at some of the older stations, you have like uh, little machines here and there and a signal and then even just knowing what you have is a huge task. Now, uh, who are all these uh, new approaches? Where do we see them in the field? What are good examples of, of, of countries that are using it? Yeah, well, we use this in a lot of our projects in uh, very, very different um, countries and places in the world. I'd start with our project in London, where our customer require um, that we um, we provide vulnerability monitoring. So providing the the, the software patching and uh, to um, to to make this uh, vulnerabilities uh, secure and uh, not available for hackers to attack the system. So in, in the past, the customers, okay, please send your system, and then uh, we'll try to keep it safe. Now, from the start, they say, no, you, you deliver your system, signaling, whatever, but you also make sure it's always up to date, it has its patches, it's always safe. Y yes, this is a risk-based assessment, so we monitor the vulnerabilities and then um, see what's, what's uh, the impact on our system. Is it relevant and then we deliver our patches to the customers. And how are these patches delivered? Do you, do you imagine people like running around and doing it manually? How does it work? Yeah, usually uh, in the past it used to be like that uh, a technician would go with a stack of CDs and walk through the um, s uh, like the um, uh, technical rooms and insert the CD and note, okay, did I insert the right software to the right uh, computer and document that, everything manually. So when and you met that person on the tube, you might say, oh, are you a <laughs> DJ? You have all these CDs. It feels very 1990s. Exactly. It does. It does. But what we try to do is to have a centralized computer uh, or a server where the patches are uploaded and then the customer can pull their, um, can pull their updates and run them um, to, the, to their uh, systems. So, so now it happens remotely. What are the new risks this brings? Um, this happens also remotely. So we're working uh, on that with uh, a bunch of our customers, for example, in uh, Brazil, where uh, we do the um, updating or uh, um, yeah, updating to a newer version in, uh, um, um, of a software. And this needs, for example, a lot of encryption of the data, the, the way you know it from uh, WhatsApp, for example, where you have a end-to-end -end encrypted communication from A to B. And and also to limit the access that nobody can insert any malicious software to the to the system and do whatever they want to do with it. So, so it's like as, as if I were running a huge WhatsApp group with all my devices <laughs> in the field and I, yeah. I can be sure nobody is telling them the wrong things to do the wrong things. Exactly. It's not like exactly the, that way, but you try to prevent that the wrong people get into your WhatsApp group. You can think of it okay. in that way. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's happening in Brazil, for example, and Norway, it's, it's a fantastic example because I think there, there are more projects on the way. Yeah, uh, so Norway we, we, is our flagship project when it comes to security because there we provide security uh, by design. Um, so contrary to what we do, for example, to our legacy system, sometimes our customers come to us and say, okay, we need uh, to encrypt the communication between a station, the main station and another station station so we give them or sell them some um, um, yeah some devices that allow the encryption from A to B and this is an additional hardware you need to 
implement. Um, for Norway, it's different. It's uh, we uh, implement security in each and every component, starting from the hardware and providing uh, on top of the hardware a secure platform that is that provides. Um, uh, interfaces for a different security um, um, mechanisms that you can implement and take this advantage and implement it in the apps you need uh, need to run your uh, that system. Makes me think of what Andres, what you, what you said yeah. earlier, yeah. right? I can build a great system and then say, mm, yeah, it also needs to be secure. Let's build a big wall around it. That's right. really old school. Yeah. Now what I need to do with every single component right from the start i have to think okay uh, where are the risks how does it play with the others how do i connect it and and that's now how we do it yeah yeah in general the way we try to see it is a bit of a complete value chain so um what, what Drew was mentioning with uh with our project in norway um uh, norway for us is an exciting project because it's uh, it's the first project in which not only the complete system um, has a full security by design and that is because also the first system we are deploying nationwide is for the whole country. It's quite ambitious. It's every element is somewhat new. So they are going with state of the art uh, technology, meaning that they're taking a fully fresh start. Let's let's a full, let's do um, it all. Let's correct. It's change a, it's it all. A, it's a full fresh start, which um, from 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 a from a technology perspective is <laughs> is your is your dream, right? Because it allows you to basically build the next generation of infrastructure, and that's why Norway uh, put the trust in Siemens to basically say, okay, uh, one, our proposal was based on what Rua mentioned, in the, which we are not only taking an approach of building a few boxes and doing some software and some applications, and then we put it together, and that's it. We we thought about uh, and raising the bar, um, not only for us, but to the complete market and saying, we're going to build a, 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 a core platform, a standardized secure operating system that will run across all of our products. That means small components, big interlockings, train control, communication devices, what have you. And that allows us, um, in a bit of an example, like the way Android is. Uh, you have Android with different vendors, different type of devices. Um, and what you have there is you have one operating system that ha you can centrally control, you can centrally manage, you can centrally update, and you can bring sec functions already on the software layer without having to do it per individual product. So you simplify in a way that we take all of our components, we con connect all of those components in one system, and then we're able to secure them every time we do a project. Also, you might be able to work with fewer interlockings. We started with that in the beginning, the mini brains all around the systems, uh, the, all around the system. How many interlockings will they need in Norway? So in Norway, we need uh, a f still a, a few tens of, of interlockings. So the specific number of, uh, for interlockings in Norway is going to be yeah, roughly between 40 to 50 interlockings. It will but depend. But instead of hundreds in the, in, in, the in general, In general terms, that will be the, f the first IP-based interlocking uh, that we're going to have. It's a CNERT architecture. But the most interesting part is where that, that's what I was saying in the beginning. The, the trend is that, yes, in the future, we're going to see that most of these functions will be virtualized. Most of these functions will require, will require more commercial of the shelf hardware. And then what you want to worry about is what software is there and who controls the security and who controls the integrity of it all. Okay, I, I, I get you, because if you get the, the baddie from the James Bond movie with the white cat and hacking into the system, leading the trains astray, exactly that we don't want to happen, and that's why cybersecurity needs to go down to every single component. That's yeah. the value chain. Yeah, and, uh, and the most important part and something that is uh, often overlooked is that we enjoy in a, when we're talking about this, we're talking in a, in a business and enterprise environment, in a commercial and uh, in a uh, user environment, we're used to having a few operating system for billions or hundreds of millions of devices. That never happened in industry. Uh, even in uh, energy, transportation and what have you, you have uh, an array of different operating systems. And when you have a system that does not standardize what you have, it's almost impossible um, what I to protect. Take away from, from our chat is one for for critical infrastructure like 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 rail it's just not enough to build something build a wall and think it's fine no Correct. cyber security today and in the future is part of every single small component and of every system in the system and because of that 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 changes things it also changes how are we going to service rail infrastructure 
in the future. And we're going to talk about that with two more experts for now. Big thanks to both of you. Thanks for joining. Thanks.